Welcome to the Eden Church, where we endeavor to lift Christ, seek the salvation of the unsaved, foster unity of faith, and promote a more excellent way of living. We thank each of you for worshiping with us today. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to this, another opportunity for virtual worship. I am excited and delighted that you have connected with us and that you remain connected. So let me say to you, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited for this Sunday morning whereby we have the freedom and the liberty to extol and exalt and give God the praise that he is so rightfully deserving of. And so let me just thank you for staying connected to each and every member and also to every visitor who count themselves a part of the equation that make up this virtual worship service. Let me ask us to remain in prayer for all those persons who are sick, shed in, bereaved, and most certainly we are praying for those persons who are waiting to be healed and delivered. We are praying for you. We continue to extend our prayers and condolences to Mother Brenda King Tyrus and the entire Tyrus family. We also extend our prayers and condolences to David and Devon Moore in the recent transitioning of Devon's father, Mr. Thomas Womack. Special prayers also requested for Mother Jeanette Mackins. Also, we continue to pray for J.C. Anderson and her entire family while they go through some health challenges during this season. We are also praying for Brenda Knowles, and we're praying for Ann Crane. We're keeping them lifted up in our prayer. Special thanks to everyone of you who came out to support our homecoming parking lot pull up park and praise in the parking lot here at the church. Let me thank you, thank you, thank you. And those who remain connected to us, even from a virtual means, even with a shift of time, thank you so very much. I want to give a great big shout out and thanks and appreciation to our music department, our praise team and the production team that were able to assist us. Derek, thank you so much. And Gabe, thank you so very much. All of you all who played an intricate part in ensuring that we were able to broadcast live. Tony McCullough, thank you, sir. Let me thank all of you for making sure that we were live live, lights, action cameras, live right here on the campus. Special thanks is also extended to everyone who reached out to me as I celebrated. I know you're not going to believe this. 43 years of preaching. I don't even look 43 years young. Let me just say, I appreciate you. It goes without saying that you are appreciated because people don't have to be nice to you. Thank you for stopping and texting, sending messages, calling, sending Sending uh, love offerings, whatever you did during that time, I appreciate YOU. I appreciate you. Thank you again. Let me also admonish you that if you were born in the month of August, make sure you submit your photos to be displayed on the last Sunday, next Sunday, the fifth Sunday. Info at the Enonchurch.org next Sunday. Please allow me this opportunity during the month of August to stop, pause, and thank God for the gift that he's given me in my baby girl, Danielle Cartier Pollard, celebrated her 21st birthday, 21st birthday on last Sunday. That Danielle, I tell you, girl, I am very much proud of the young lady that you are and that you're becoming as you walk in the steps in the movement of your mother. Let me also remind us that as the Delta uh, and also the new, uh, the Lambda variant, the Delta and Lambda variant both continue to cause a rise in COVID hospitalization and deaths, make sure that you take the necessary precautions to stay safe, stay safe. Everybody just say that with me, Gabby. I'm gonna put it, ask you to put it on the screen, stay safe. Stay safe, ladies and gentlemen. Get vaccinated. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Continue to practice social distancing. And in partnership with CORE and Fulton County, we were able, during our service on last Sunday, to vaccinate 26 people. Even though CORE was here a little later, started later, but we were able to vaccinate 26 people on last Sunday. And while that number seems to be low, we celebrate those who took advantage of this much needed opportunity to continually fight against this pandemic of coronavirus. Let me just say to you that if you are in need of prayer, 
you're in need of food, you're in need of counseling or financial assistance. You need to know any of those things. All you've got to do, if you really want to know the plan that God has for your life, you can text the keyword Enon Prayer, Enon Support, join Enon, Enon Salvation to the number 54244. Enon Prayer, Enon Support, join Enon. If you'd like to join the ministry, it's simple now. In these times in which we live, we orchestrated the steps to make sure that we're able to assist you in that process. Don't wait until we get back here because it appears that it's going to be a while. 54244 join in them. And then there are three ways to give. Three ways. You can give by mailing it to us here at the address that you see on the screen, 3550 Enon Road, Atlanta, Georgia, 30349. Or you can go on to our website to the online giving portion and give your tithe and offering. That way, go down to the online giving portion, share your gifts. You can give your pastor's love offering, brother's keeper's offering, tithe and offering. Most certainly do that first. Tithe and offering, brother's keeper's offering, scholarship ministry, pastor's love offering. Anything you wish to give in that thrive, you can give by texting also to the number 54244, the keyword Enon MG, Enon Mobile Giving. Now, I want you to position yourself and get yourself ready for the word that is going to come forth today. Romans chapter number 12, Romans chapter number 12, as we are in the sermonic series of worship. Let's go to worship. And so here's the thing that I want you to take account. If you're taking notes, the first thing is in this sermon today, a response to God's mercy. That needs to be a response to God's mercy. Then number two, that you offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Number three, living sacrifices, not a dead sacrifice. Because up until this time of Romans chapter 12, that we know that people were going to the temple and giving sacrificial gifts that were dead sacrifices. But now Jesus comes on the scene. He's died for us, and now he challenges us to make sure that we give a living sacrifice. And so that living sacrifice equals a giving continual sacrifice. And so then number four, the true and proper worship. And that's worship that is reasoned. I have a reason to worship God because God, number one, died for me. He challenges me to worship him. And so get yourself ready. Get up in that house. Go ahead and keep those notes and stay prepared. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I want you to get there and get ready as the praise team takes us to the place. And then we'll get to the sermonic. Let's go to worship. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping So you clean me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrifice your life So I can be free So I can be whole So I can tell Yeah. So you came to change my life. You thought you 
changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for Oh You thought I was to die for Eternal and gracious God, our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege and opportunity that you've afforded us today to come into this sanctuary. God, I thank you for the virtual connection that you continue to give us. We honor you in and for all things. We ask now that you give us preaching power, not for the likes of men, but that you might be glorified. We become edified and the devil horrified as we seek to walk in the authority that you've transferred to our lives God bless my mind call back to remembrance all those things you and I have shared about this word speak with clarity touch heal deliver do as you will God we honor you and we thank you for the gift Jesus Christ and I pray that as a result of knowing that he is our very present gift always that we will know that we have everything we need through the total sufficiency of who your son Jesus Christ is bless us now touch this word make it a rhema word a word that's tailor made exclusive design with us in mind in the name of Jesus God we thank you now and we bless your name amen Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. I wonder, do you love him? Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. It sounds like music to my ear. Guess what it is? It's the sweet his name on earth. Come on, one last time. Oh. I love Jesus. I love him. I love him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Ooh. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I believe I could do that so much better if you were here, <laughs> most certainly. But we thank God for the word today. I want you to condition yourself as we have been in, in a pursuit of uh, talking about worship, talking about worship. Let's go to worship. It is a series, and we've been preaching, talked last, last, last week about uh, rendering worship that's worthy. We talked about high-definition worship, and today... I want you to get your Bible, go with me to Romans chapter 12. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 1, a very familiar passage of Scripture. There are two versions that I want to read into our hearing today, and one is the New King James Version, and the other being the New International Version of the Hebrew context of the Bible, and uh, we'll show and tell why we are doing the two different versions. Just one verse in that chapter, Romans chapter 12, and it says, I beseech you, in the New King James Version, I beseech you therefore, brethren and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies the living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to hear how we read it in the New International Version of the Hebrew context. Listen what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view, watch this, of God's mercy to offer your body a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is, watch this, and here's where we bring our emphasis. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. And so just for a few moments, I want to just share with you this morning about true worship, true worship. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you, for the past few weeks, as I have already exclaimed, we've talked in detail regarding worship. And so this morning, we turn our attention again to that subject of worship. And let me start this week by defining to you again and echoing what I've already said in weeks past, that worship and what defining what worship is, worship as the grateful surrender, the grateful surrender of one's self, will, intellect, and emotions to God. And so when we surrender ourselves to God, offering all that we are, which includes our possessions, and I know that's really alien to a lot of people because it's amazing how God can bless us, bless us, bless us, bless us, and then we rob, 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 rob God. But our possessions, our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so to, to the one only true living God that we worship, we ought to render the totality of who we are to our God. As a matter of fact, the Bible is full of examples of worship. Worship is what Abel did when he brought the firstlings of his flock in Genesis chapter 4. It is what Abraham did when he offered Isaac and at the altar. It is what Isaac did when he allowed, you know, make sure you take note that he allowed a 100-year-old father to put him on an altar. And that story is told in Genesis chapter number 22. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please understand that worship is what Judah did in 2 Chronicles chapter number 20 when they went out to the battlefield only armed with instruments and armed with their white robes, their white choir robes. They're going to sing on the battlefield. And make sure you understand when you read 2 Chronicles chapter 20, how they left is how God allowed them to come back. If you leave home in worship, God would allow you to return with the same worship. Worship, ladies and gentlemen, is a, in a real sense, is what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he resolved, not my will, but your will be done. Worship comes down to this. The offering of one's self, putting one all on the line for God to be used. Notice that I said that to be used. Teacher was talking to the students one day and she was inquisitive as to what they did to help around the house. One little girl said, I washed the dishes. One other gentleman said, I sweep the floor. And then little Johnny, as always, little Johnny was in the corner didn't say anything, and they asked, she said, why are you, well, you're not talking, Johnny? What is it that you do to help around the house? He said, well, I just stay out of the way. And that's really how a lot of Christians do. 
They just stay out of the way. But God is trying to enlist us after we learn to present our bodies a living sacrifice in worship, he's trying to tell us to work to advance the kingdom. And he pins, Paul does, Romans chapter 12, verse number one, Paul really forces with a, a laser-like, if you let me use my imagination, laser-like intensity on the concept of worship, noting that true and proper worship is offering one's body as a living sacrifice. And I really want us to unpack Paul's teaching, but to be fair to Paul, to unpack his teaching, I think it would be beneficial for us to also unpack uh, who Paul really is. Who is this apostle Paul? I need you to see the real Paul, a master of rhetoric, and most certainly rhetoric as we know it, is not really rhetoric as Paul knew it because it is the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing. And as eloquent as any poet, as rudiment as a mind that he had of any philosopher of his day, Paul himself, a Jew, completed advanced study in Jewish religion, culture, anthropology, at the feet of the Reverend Dr. Gamaliel. And so he was a scholar who was after his conversion experience on the Damascus Road, put everything he had into serving Almighty God. Yet Paul never ever, ladies and gentlemen, he never ever forgot where he came from. Matter of fact, you ought to put that in the comment. Don't forget where you came from, where you come from. Yes, he was a Roman citizen, but he was first and foremost a Jew. And there were times that Paul stood in a duality of personality that he could go this way or that way. And so as because he knows who he is and he is not ashamed of his heritage, Paul always uses the Jewish worldwide as a canvas upon which he paints for us by use of rhetorical skill, his rhetorical skill, a picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is a preacher. He's a preacher with a flair of poetic, prolific pro proclamation. And so he chooses his words deliberately. And so if we are going to unpack Ladies and gentlemen, the exhortation of true worship, true proper worship, we need to see the real Paul. I think that would be beneficial for us because not the Paul whose writings have been, as I would say, because many find because of his writings are so extensive that Paul is one that many preachers preach about. And so I would say his preaching and teaching, his writings have been soundbited and taken out of context as a pretext to proof text passages of scripture. So Paul's complex portfolio reminds us all that in Christ there is no demographic divisions, no class distinction, no gender lines, Christ in Christ. There is neither male, the Bible says, or female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek. Stay with me today, we're going somewhere. Don't let misinterpretation of Paul's writing by people with agendas cause you to dismiss Paul's God-inspired word that really sets on the table to challenge us beyond where we worship. Paul is trying to help us answer the question, what, and this is what I want you to ask, ask yourself, what does worship look like after the benediction? What does worship look like after the benediction? I believe I can do better if you just pray with me where you are. Because using the language of imaginary of sacrifice, Paul says that true and proper worship looks like the offering of one's body as a living sacrifice.
And so he notes this offering is made in response. Watch this. This is very key. He says, I'm going to respond to God by giving him my body because he's given me his mercy. <laughs> Listen here. Here again, the words of Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse number one, New International Version of Transliteration. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Get that. In this text, you will find Paul uses key words and phrases that will help us unlock the meaning of the text. Because the key word uh, are, he says, offer. Offer in the New King James Version. Present and bodies. He says those words so freely. He says, offer, present, and bodies. The key phrase are living sacrifices and true and proper worship. So Paul, Paul says, if you would engage, watch this, in true and proper worship, we must offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. So according to Paul, worship, here it come closer to you now, make sure you get this. Here it come, here it come. Paul, according to Paul, worship is rather uncomplicated. To worship by its very nature, the verb, an action word. To worship is to respond to God's mercy by offering our bodies and our souls as living sacrifices. So God has shown mercy toward us. We ought to respond by offering offering our individual selves as living sacrifices. So when we do this, we give God true and proper worship. All right, let's go to work right here. Verse, here's, here's point number one. Point number one, respond, respond to God's mercy. So the energized exhortation of the text is as clear as it is conclusive. Because worship that is true and proper is a surrender of oneself offered by us individually in response to God's mercy. Paul says that any of us, each of all of us, all of us ought to be able to look back in retrospect. We ought to be able to look back in the rear view mirror behind us and reflect upon the mercies of God, how God has blessed us, how God has provided for us, how God has saved us, and how God keeps us with ways made, doors open, and promises kept. And so when you think about the mercy of God, Something deep down on the inside ought to motivate you to offer something back to God for all God has done. And all that we own is ourself. When we consider what the Lord has done, each of us ought to join with David and declare, not just with our mouth, but with our action, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Listen, I dare you to look back over your life and consider God's mercy. I'm going to give you a minute. Just look back. You don't have to look just during COVID-19. You can look back at the year before COVID. Matter of fact, you don't even have to look back that far. Look at yesterday day. And just think about it, and I wonder if there's anybody watching who knows something about being a beneficiary of the mercies of God. Because that mercy that the prophet Jeremiah declares knew every morning, like Jesse Lee Pollard would often say, that's the only kind of mercy that can suit my case. So the psalmist proclaims that God's mercy 
endures forever. Yeah, it forever, forever, forever. That's a long time. Tell somebody that's a long time. God's mercy, mercy that cuts through the chaos of our lives. Got somebody. And makes all things work together for good. Mercy that doesn't reward us according to our deeds, but mercy that looks beyond our, need, our deeds and supply our needs. Reflection upon the Lord's mercy ought to motivate us to worship God. But again, as a practical matter, what does worship look like after the benediction? What do we do? I mean, we know what praise looks like. Hmm. Because something about praise, praise can be faked. Because don't you think everybody that's clapping when they're in church, meaning some folk has just learned when to clap. They've learned when to say amen. Matter of fact, sometimes they'll just move according to what they've heard in a recent moment. So we know what praise looks like. Singing, clapping, shouting, dancing, bowing, playing music, instruments. But now, what does worship look like? What does it look like to surrender yourself to God? This is what I've been trying to get to. Watch this. Th that is, I believe, the point Paul is writing here in Romans chapter 12. Because Paul, the scholar, master of rhetoric, and I, I dare to call him uh, a poet of Laurinet of the New Testament, purposefully uses the image of sacrifice to help us grasp the concept of worship in a practical term. Worship says Paul looks like Sacrifice. Worship looks like sacrifice. Then sacrifice what? Our bodies. Offer our bodies. By urging us to offer our bodies, Paul reminds his audience that was done in worship temple. What was done there where the worshiper made a formal, watch this, presentation. A formal presentation of what? Pastor, good question. Glad you asked. The animals that were wished to offer up to God, we too should offer our bodies to God as a sacrifice. Because in the temple times, worshipers brought an unblemished sacrificial animal and offered it to God at the temple door by laying his or her hands on the head of the animal in the presence of the priest. And by doing so, the animal was offered to God, stay with me today, and God then accepted the offer of the animal as a substitute for the worshiper's sin. But please pay attention. Pay attention now. Because in the temple when the animal was offered as a sacrifice, more than just the body was sacrificed. There was a second key word, the body, that more than just the body that the animals were offered. Because watch this, if the animal is offered as a sacrifice, the more than the hide and the hoof was offered. The teeth and the toes, the blood and the bones were offered to God because the first step in sacrificing the animal involved taking the animal's life. I want you to get it. Hold on to that. We're coming back. Because in sacrificial economy of worship, the life of the offered animal was taken in exchange for the worship of sin. And though the body of the animal was offered at the temple door, the whole animal was sacrificed. What does worship look like? It looks like a sacrifice. Where well, that which is offered, Paul says, our bodies, where well, that which is offered is given, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy. You got to give it holy to be holy. 
Got to give it W-H-O-L-L-Y in order to have it H-O-L-Y. It was wholly given to God. Watch this. Because in the text, Paul uses the image and the imagery of sacrificial presentation of our body to emphasize that the fact that presenting ourselves to God means more than surrendering our physical being. To offer your body involves the surrender of everything that makes you, you. And so just offering a body of the animal symbolized the presentation of the whole animal, so does Paul reference the, to offering our bodies implying the presentation of, watch this, here it is, our whole self. Not our Sunday morning self. Not our choir rehearsal self. Not our Bible study self, our Sunday school self, but our whole self. And I'm teaching this to you because when we come back, I want us to be better than we were before. So Paul now knew that when we Christians are often inclined to relate to God like the anonymous woman in the OJ's song. All too often when it comes to worship, God could really say, your body's here with me, but your mind is on the other side of town. I just backed into that and you didn't catch it. You see, to call to true and proper worship, we come back to the phrase in a moment. I'm gonna come back, but the call to true and proper worship is to call to offer one's entire self, not just our mind, not just our body, not just our talent, not just our money, not just our time when it's convenient. We are called to worship God with our all. To make our whole self available for God to use. And what I like about Paul, Paul, even though he passed at all those churches, he never gives a reference that we are allowed the, the avenue by which we can allow other people to stop us from doing what God has required. Mm, that, was, that was for free. Worship looks like sacrifice where you lay it all on the altar. On the altar where you lay it all on the altar. And so the question comes, Tim, the old song, is your all on the altar? Does your heart and the spirit control and declares by demonstration you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest when, when you yield him your body and your soul. So every Christian has been called to present their entire body as a sacrifice themselves individually. And so when we worship, we present ourselves and that makes you, you all, that means all of what you got, all of what you potentially can do, you give it all to God, inside out. Body, mind, and spirit. Presenting our individual selves to God involves the surrender of everything. No holes barred. No holes barred. Everything I am and everything I have. I know some of you done turn it off now when I say everything you have. Paul says we ought to give it all. And in case that ain't clear enough, when you give your all, there ain't nothing left. Give yourself. I give myself away so you can use me. Give your all, time, talent, treasure. Paul exhorts and reminds us to worship is to sacrifice all. Now, there's a shift in this text, and I got to point that out, or else I could be finished. But watch this, living sacrifice. Somebody say living sacrifice. Now, notice Paul says something about the nature of sacrifice that we offer to God. Watch this. Because Paul says that what we offer is to be a living sacrifice. Hmm. 
a living sacrifice. We just got through talking about dead animals, but now we're talking about living sacrifice. Did I mention that Paul has a poetic predication here? Because prior to Paul's articulation in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, there is no such thing as a living sacrifice. Under temple law, the animal whose body was offered to God subsequently was killed. And so the animal was understood to be dead at the door. Are y'all still with me? So in context of the focal text, however, Paul purposefully jars us from this standard connotation by intentionally modifying the noun sacrifice with an adjective of living. Why living? Because the last dead sacrifice was offered on a hill called Calvary. Called Calvary. And so when God raised Jesus, oh, here it is, from the dead on resurrection Sunday morning, that was it. God don't want no dead sacrifice. So the rules of sacrifice at Calvary was forever changed. There's no more need for dead sacrifices. Christ died once, I told you last week, once and for all, God's sacrifice and his sacrificial economy requires life, not death. So the other side of Calvary, God is looking for a living sacrifice. Somebody said the other side of Calvary. All right. And so a sacrifice that may be offered over and over again, a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice in payment for sin, debt, but a living sacrifice in recognition, Paul says, of the mercies of God. And so we offer ourselves a living sacrifice as a way of telling God, I thank you for your mercy. So the next time you get ready to offer something to God, you just tell him, God, I thank you for your mercy. Because nothing else in the world can provide the mercy that we need other than God. We offer ourselves all of our recognition that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be here. We offer ourselves as living sacrifices to remind ourselves and thanking God for all that God is, was, and will forever be. As long as I have life, I can offer myself, my life, as a living sacrifice. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and lay the days, let them flow ceaseless with praise. Take my silver and my gold, not my might, would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal, on thy royal throne. That's what a living sacrifice looks like. All I have, everything I got, gratefully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. I give myself away so you can use me. All right, here's the next thing. True and proper worship is reasoned. There's a reason. Paul says that when you offer ourselves and we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, we engage in worship that is true and proper. In the Greek, Paul uses the phrase translated true and proper in the NIV. Spiritual worship in the New Revised Standard Version. Reasonable service in the King James and New King James Version. And so there's a, there's a word that's called legikios latreia. Okay? Legikios latreia. Perhaps a little trip through the original language might help you better understand the key phrase. Because the first word, lekiyas, lekikiyas, is the root word from which we get the word logic. And it is what we do with reasoning. 
the ability to come to a conclusion. The second word, latria, means act of worship. And so when the two Greek words are put together, we pay attention to the historical and cultural context of Paul's word when he said leke trias, he says that may be more clearly understood to refer to worship that results with reasoning. Worship is logical, is a logical response. Worship is that we give back to God in response to God. Worship responds to God's mercy. Remember the way in which Paul opens this exhortation. He says, I urge you to worship and respond logically. It is demonstrated through the mercy of God. It becomes reasonable. So we give God true and proper worship when we surrender ourselves, our all to God in view of God's mercy. True and proper worship, the kind of worship that God desires, the kind of worship that God deserves is the worship that when you think about it, it just makes good sense. Romans 12 and 1 is an exhortation to worship God. It comes to us in the form of an argument. Here again, the theme scripture in a more modern tellish translation. It says, my brothers and sisters, I beg you in light of all that God has done for you, that you offer your entire selves as living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God. It is true and proper. It just makes sense to worship God this way. And so Paul is really making an appeal. If Paul were writing the 21st century Christian in America, in urban America, he might put it this way. Look here, y'all. He might just say it just like this. Look at y'all. You just think about all that God has done for you, often your entire body, it just make good sense. If he's the one that's controlling your every move, if he's the one that sustains you and keep you alive, then why don't you just give it up? That's all Paul is saying. It ain't deep. It ain't mysterious like Revelation last week. Paul says it makes sense that we ought to offer ourselves to God because God has done so much for us. As I think about all that God has done for me in my own life, I ask myself a question I used to hear my mama ask many times. As a little boy, I would hear my mother say, who wouldn't serve a God like that? Just think about all he's done for you when I was young. I used to wonder what she meant. But as I got older, I came to understand mama was reminding everybody under the sound of her voice that we, that we owe God true and proper worship. What I discovered, mama was born in 1930. She didn't go to no college. She didn't go to no seminary, but she had common sense. And it just makes good sense. When you think about it, it makes good sense. The Lord has kept us. And the Lord has brought us. The Lord loves us. And he continues to bless us. We are beneficiaries of his mercy. It just makes good sense to respond to God with just by giving him all we got in worship. Not in praise, but in worship. Yielding your body after the benediction, giving God all you have. Giving the world a pictureistic view of who Christ is in your spiritual deportment, in your walk, and in your talk. Worshiping, offering our entire self as a living sacrifice. Worshiping, expressing gratitude, it makes sense that if he gave his life for me, I ought to be willing to serve him until the day is done. I don't know why he loved me. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life for me. 
but I'm so glad he did. He's done so much for me. I can't tell it all. I can't tell it all. Ain't enough YouTube to do that. But I can respond by offering myself as a living sacrifice. I can give the Lord true and proper worship. And that's the worship you give God when ain't nobody in the sanctuary. It's the continuation after the benedicti, the benediction. Can you say that today? I surrender all. I surrender all. That's true and proper worship. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I give myself away so you, God, can use me. When I think about all he's done for me, it just makes good sense to give him true and proper worship. I got to offer myself as a living sacrifice and tell the Lord when I get him on the line, forgive me for my iniquities. Cleanse me of my diseases and crown me with loving kindness and let your mercy continue to flow. He saved my soul. The Lord made me whole. The Lord keeps me. The Lord leads me. The Lord bless me. And he's doing it right now. Because for the rest of my life, I will serve him until the day is done. True worship. Give it to him. True worship. Give it to him. I tell you what, your life will look a little better to you. You live in a place called peace. Give it to him. Jeremiah said there are new mercies every morning. And I tried to figure out why Jeremiah said that every morning, why not every night? <laughs> and I believe he said every morning simply because as you face a new day, you can't use old mercy for your new challenge. And when you worship God and when you find yourself in the place of rendering all you have to him. True and proper worship is to give your life to Christ. Somebody's watching right now. I pray that you have come to the place of decision if you are not a part of the church that you can text 54244 in on salvation and learn about the plan that God has for you. Stop right there where you are. Stop right where you are. And say, Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. I confess that I believe that you died. I confess that I believe you got up early with the power of God. Sunday morning. Stood on resurrection ground. I confess that I'm weak. And I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved by your grace. Blot out my sins and my transgression. Restore unto me the joy. If you prayed that prayer, if you said, Lord, have mercy on my soul, he heard you. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's true with proper worship. When you can give yourself to Christ. Until next time. Now unto him. Who's able to keep us from falling. Present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Be both glory. Dominion and let's add power. Now henceforth. And forevermore. I pray this word has blessed you. I pray that you are really considering the fact. His mercy is what keeps you. His mercy is what wake you up in the morning. Because none of us deserve the privilege. None of us deserve the moment. But 
Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. That there were times I was unlovable to myself, but he loved me in spite of me. God bless you. I got to go. We clap our hands.